Greetings and welcome to our Center Place History, Theology, and Philosophy Lecture Series. <clears throat> if you um, are new to this channel and you like this video, I invite you to press like on the video and also uh, subscribe to the channel. We regularly explore a wide variety of topics in the fields of history, theology, philosophy, including Christianity, paganism, world religions, uh, the history of the Middle Ages, uh, all kinds of different topics. You can view our complete library of lectures uh, at centerplace.ca slash lectures, and there's now over 100 um, lectures that are actually on there. Um, we do mention our, les our lectures are listener-supported. Um, if you would like to make a contribution uh, to, in support of these so that we can um, continue to emphasize this and do more of them, uh, those are actually tax deductible in the United States and Canada. And you can make, if you make your donation at centerplace.ca slash donate, you can also um, donate in, by Facebook or, or YouTube, but it doesn't work the same way. So in that case, it's not a tax deductible donation. Um, we do have a whole bunch of uh, lectures that are upcoming. We've published our calendar all the way out through the end of the first quarter. And so on Thursday at this time, uh, we're having a companion lecture. This is actually one that was given a couple years ago uh, when we were able to hold in-person uh, lectures here at Center Place. And that's on the topic, what is spirituality? Um, and in some ways that's gonna dovetail very nicely with our theme tonight, our question tonight, what is religion? <clears throat> next week, uh, our next live lecture is going to be kind of a follow-up on a um, lecture we gave a month ago on the historical Jesus. We're going to focus specifically on what we can say about Jesus' Jewish roots, so the context uh, of Judaism of the Second Temple period in uh, Galilee at the time, when Jesus of Nazareth would have been active. And so hopefully that'll also be pretty interesting for everyone. So we're not have, able to have in-person events because of uh, COVID-19. And as we're um, still working to stop the spread of, of infections and so forth. Nevertheless, tonight is, uh, we're doing this live and it is an interactive presentation. So if you post your comments and questions uh, in the YouTube and Facebook chats, um, Leandro is monitoring both of those. It's actually a lot, the, the chats have very, been very active and so it's not the easiest thing for him to do, but he's trying to keep track and, uh, and he'll send those on to me and we'll respond at the end of the main lecture uh, to those and have, we've been having some pretty good dialogue at the end of these. And so I look forward to uh, your comments and your questions and so forth. Our topic tonight is what is religion? <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty broad topic, not a small topic. And in some ways we maybe think, well, this is kind of a, maybe an obvious question. We maybe already have an idea of what religion is and so on and can point to some religions and say, we know what this, what, what this is. So what could this uh, lecture be about? Like I say, the question may seem self-evident, both to people who understand themselves to be followers or adherents of a religion, um, as well as people who imagine that they are not religious or who define themselves as not religious. But um, we want to look at what this word means or what this, where this word comes from and what is actually uh, meant when we talk about religion as a, in a much more general sense. Um, by analogy, <laughs> as another thing that uh, hasn't always been easy to uh, identify or define, but it's easy to identify but not define, um, uh, on the topic of pornography when uh, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart was judging an obscenity case in 1964, he sort of famously declared, quote, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material that I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description, in other words, pornography, uh, and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so. So in other words, I'm not gonna be able to define this better, but he says, I know it when I see it, <laughs> And the motion picture involved in this case is not that. So in other words, he has a kind of a idiosyncratic um, definition of, of this concept. He knows it when he sees it. And so maybe many of us may also feel we know religion when we see it. 
So knowing religion without defining it. Um, it may well be um, that we have an idea of what religion is without actually in our own, for our own selves, defining the term with any kind of precision. So, for example, when we're thinking about, well, what constitutes a religion? And so one of the apparent characteristics we probably would go to right away is, let's say, sharing beliefs, especially some kind of belief in either God or a go gods, a group of gods, or at least maybe some kind of supernatural beings, angels, spirits, forces of nature, or something like that. In other words, sharing kind of a beliefs in the transcendent or supernatural or something like that. We probably can point on the landscape to uh, religions as building sacred spaces, whether they called churches or mosques or synagogues or temples or whatever they might be called, depending on the religion. We might be um, thinking, well, okay, religions perform various kinds of rituals, doing things like prayer or meditation or giving sermons, uh, having big festivals together, maybe doing things like performing ritual sacrifices, um, also life events, so things like marriages, funerals, baby blessings, coming of age uh, types of rituals. We probably would point to the idea of like a reverence for holy books, especially often ancient texts uh, where, where that a religion, depending on how old the religion is, <laughs> as their text, uh, where individuals who are adherents to that religion um, get meaning about how to live a moral life and maybe also ideas about the meaning of life that informs them those texts. And so in addition to those kind of like a shorthand of maybe characteristics that we think of offhand when we're thinking about religions, we also can probably list a large number of things that we also identify as religions. So it's the other, other way of defining not the definition, but rather a set and the different um, subsets or units within that set. So for example, the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are of course the most familiar in the West. But beyond those Abrahamic religions, even if you live in the West here, like in Canada, um, you'd be very aware of religions from India, like Hinduism and Sikhism. Um, also, also from India originally is Buddhism, but of course that has also traveled all around uh, the world, especially the East, and other Eastern religions like Taoism. We are also familiar here in Canada that First Nations people, indigenous peoples, have traditions that fall into the category of religion. So First Nations spirituality, First Nations religious traditions. And we're probably aware that there are some like new religions that have been founded in the relatively recent past, uh, even within people's lifetimes still, depending on how old you are. Um, and those nevertheless fill that kind of category when we think of uh, what religions are. We're also perhaps aware of religions from the past, and in the, particularly here in the Western tradition, we're aware of religions in the Western past that are now extinct, albeit um, there are modern revivals of, of, all, of these, um, all of these religions. So for example, the old religions of the gods of ancient Greece and Rome, we now call this paganism, but it wasn't called paganism at the time, uh, likewise, the religion of ancient Egypt, the religion of the Vikings, Norse gods, and so forth. And we may be fairly aware even of uh, Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Viking Norse uh, uh, pantheons as they continue to have inform like popular characters in our culture today, like Thor and Odin and, and, and so forth, Hercules and so forth. Um, we have a whole lecture actually on untangling uh, Greek and Roman paganism, and it's and especially Greek and Roman mythology, and that's kind of I point you to that as a, an interesting uh, topic. Okay, so we have that. We have this kind of general sense of what a religion is, and we have this list of things we consider to be religions. And so, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, why is it when we say what is religion? Why is it that there is actually uh, no scholarly consensus on a definition for that term. 
That seems like pretty crazy, in fact, that that would be the case. It's not that there's no definition of the word religion. There's too many definitions of the word religion. And depending on, uh, uh, anyway, not all these definitions are, they're not all mutually inclusive. They're exclusive of each other. And so um, I'm going to say, and I suggest, and what we're going to kind of cover in this lecture, um, that the reason why we have this problem is that the very idea of religion as a broad category is itself a modern construct. And in fact, it's a construct that was formulated by thinkers in the West in the early modern time periods, the 16, 1700s and so forth, when they were far less aware of all of the other religions of the world and were mostly, in fact, when they were defining religion, they were thinking in terms of Christianity especially, but also Christianity's near neighbor, Judaism and Islam. And, uh, and so they were kind of, you know, anyway, less aware of those two, the people who were defining this. Uh, and so the construct is especially based on this context and it's less meaningful when we get anywhere outside of the immediate context of Abrahamic religions in the modern era. Okay, so as religious studies has emerged as an academic discipline, scholars have concluded, in fact, that most of the world's religions, present and past, don't neatly fit into this kind of construct, this thumbnail um, that I drew, pit, um, painted with you at the beginning of the lecture here. So, for example, um, it's completely possible, we said as our first thing, uh, believing in God or gods or the divine or something like that is really central to the idea of religion, maybe. But there are religions for which belief in God or gods is essentially irrelevant. And so that's true in most of Buddhism. There are forms of Buddhism where they do, or do pay attention to gods and so forth. But the gods in kind of mainline and early Buddhism are understood to be subject to the same cycle of samsara, which is to say birth and reincarnation and being kind of trapped in this uh, recurring wheel of, uh, of suffering until you finally uh, achieve enlightenment and get break free of it. The gods may be in a little better place or so forth on that cycle, but um, and nevertheless are not in charge of that cycle. So it's not the god that is one of the gods that is the creator or something like that. The system uh, exists, you know, and their gods are just simply in it and subject to it. So even though, though, Buddhism is considered, you know, is not theistic or not worried about theism, it's still nevertheless considered to be the world's fourth largest religion with some, you know, 520 million adherents, so 7% of the global population. So some people have commented, including um, on, uh, on, on the channel in the comments here, they'll say, well, wait a second, Buddhism, that, that's be, as a result of that, that means Buddhism isn't a religion, it's a philosophy. So they don't have any interest in God or gods, and so that causes some Western people to argue, wait a second, that doesn't fit my definition of what religion is. And so now I'm thinking, well, maybe Buddhism is not a religion, maybe it's a philosophy. Um, although, by the way, you don't have to a philosophy doesn't have to not be, you know, be non-theistic. Philosophies can also be theistic too. But anyway, it doesn't, that's not necessarily where the breakdown is between religion and philosophy. Um, in Buddhist majority countries, I'm going to suggest, Buddhism fills an environmental niche that overlaps significantly with the role of Christianity in Christian countries. And so in other words, regular everyday people are busy focusing on you know, living rituals within their uh, their traditional societies and so forth that are all infused with and informed by Buddhism. And they are doing that regardless of whether or not they, you know, have any particular philosophical training the same way that in, you know, Christian, you know, like a Christian village somewhere um, in the developing world, people wouldn't, uh, you know, aren't necessarily uh, philosophically trained either. In other words, they are, they are doing, um, you know, lived components of, of this religion. Okay, I'm going to point out actually that in addition, um, there's like a lot of confusion over Chinese religion. So Chinese religion defies easy categorization at all. So um, on the mainland China, um, 
there have be, been 70 years of communism, which is, is nominally atheist. And so people makes people wonder, well, does that mean that uh, Chinese, the Chinese people are simply non-religious? And so I pulled this as a map of, um, of the world's religions, uh, or majority, majority religion in each, each place, or plurality religion in each place. And you can kind of see green there for Islam, and yellow for Hinduism, and pink for uh, Protestants, and red for Catholics, and kind of brown red for Orthodox, and so forth. And then there's this huge big swash here of gray, which is um, labeled here no religion, and that's covering you know most of China. There's some little parts of China that are being uh, you know being listed here as different kinds of Buddhism and so forth. But here's another map that I also pulled off the internet. <laughs> you know, it's a simpler map, but anyway, it's doing the same kind of things. And so in this case, instead of having a big gray area for no religion, um, China has its own color, and it's being called here Chinese religion. Um, you know, whether or not, anyway, this isn't necessarily a good map. I'm not speaking for and about of any of these maps. So, but the question here is, are Chinese people um, not religious or are they have their own kind of folk religion or popular religion that includes traditional Chinese folk uh, practices and so forth with elements of Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, etc. So just if we do a little bit of a look into it, um, there was a study by Purdue University in 2010 that found that 56% of adults on the mainland China practice some kind of ancestor religion. So, um, you know, reverence for the ancestors, you know, going to uh, graves and things like this uh, or where, the, where there's memorials. Um, and in China itself, Peking University in 2012 found that only 6% of Chinese people identify as atheists and that some 80% practice some kind of Chinese folk or popular religion, including you know, worship of various gods and or veneration of forces. So pretty widespread um, uh, practices that don't necessarily seem like they're not religious or no religion anyway. Um, so the question on this first map is, <clears throat> should this area here all be the same kind of color gray? So in other words, is what um, people doing or people are doing in the countryside of China um, kind of the same as the sort of post, um, this Eastern European, so it's like Czech and East German, uh, post-communist, uh, post-religion, post-Christian uh, system that must be, that might be happening there that might actually be, be described as no religion. So is that all, all the same in that way? So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know, the kind of study of world religions and how we compare world religions, comparative religions. Um, for over 20 years here in Toronto, um, Center Place, the congregation, and also um, our denomination have sponsored a uh, charity called the Encounter World Religions Center, uh, where people come at, to Toronto to learn about and study about uh, world religions academically. And then um, when they, during the Discovery Week, the, we go on and go to the various places of worship and meet the local adherents in that place of worship. So, excuse me, for example, here, uh, you know, people from the Encounter Discovery Week group uh, meeting with the leader of the local Hare Krishna temple. So when we did this a few years ago, uh, one of the places we went uh, was to a First Nations Lodge uh, spiritual sp center uh, in downtown Toronto, where we got to talk to um, this particular uh, elder, uh, First Nations elder. And, and in him telling us about Native spirituality, he told about his own personal story about trying to, um, his own efforts and his own work at trying to recover um, the religion of his ancestors. And he told of how he had gone to all of the elders um, of his own nation, and then also to elders of other First Nations. And each time he asked them, what was a word for religion in their own language? How do they, how do they say religion in you know, uh, Ojibwe or whatever the, the different languages, all of the different languages was he's asking each elder. And again and again, he would be told, our, you know, our, our language doesn't have a word for religion. There's no such word uh, as, for, as religion in our tongue. But he went on to say that 
that doesn't mean um, that that's because uh, First Nations people uh, were not religious, that the First Nations people were not spiritual. Uh, the fact that they didn't have a word for it, you know, is not the same as saying that they weren't religious. Rather, it meant that the peoples did not have a conceptually separate, I'm sorry, they, they did not conceptually separate religion from the rest of their lives. So everything uh, the people would do from when they went fishing to when they were planting to weaving uh, to any social practice uh, was always intertwined with traditional spiritual practices. Um, and they've tried to go back to doing things like that where they're doing um, everyday life practices very intentionally uh, and accompanied by recovered rituals and so forth. So um, the conclusion here was that it was only after European colonization that natives um, had their own kind of holistic traditions conceptually separated. So European settlers drew a circle around things that they privileged, so things um, that they considered to be what religion was, which is to say native beliefs, especially native ideas about spirits and the supernatural. Those especially counted as religion. And the natives' oral traditions, kind of storytelling that they had about the origin of the world or origin of the tribe and so forth that, were, that uh, uh, Europeans categorized as mythology. In other words, they saw that as religious. So different rituals that were done, um, those seemed to be religious. Those all, as far as the settlers were concerned, those all counted as religion and got lumped together and divided off from other practices like farming or whatever, that didn't seem religious, that just seemed like what people do, right? And so those other, some components were labeled uh, as, <clears throat> from the native tradition were labeled as religious when uh, contact happened. Um, first language, nation's languages are not alone. <laughs> uh, what the, uh, the elder who went around and asked all of the uh, elders in, uh, in native tongues for a word for religion, they would have found actually if he went further afield um, prior to the modern times, uh, there were very few words that you know are directly equivalent, probably nothing that was directly equivalent of the word religion. So for example, if we go to biblical Hebrew, the Old Testament, there's no word that means religion per se, nor in the Quran, the Arabic of the Quran, is there such a word. Even English lacked a word that means religion prior to the 16th and 17th centuries. So English had the word religious and religion. Uh, those are both words that came to English via Latin and French, uh, but it had a different meaning prior to modern times. So in ancient, and there's no ancient English, but anyway, in medieval English, um, uh, the word would have meant uh, the word religious would have meant to somebody uh, belonging to a religious order. So if you say you were religious, that would mean you, or you had religion, that would mean that you have taken a vow and become a monk or a friar or a nun or something like that. So that's what the word initially meant. This new meaning that we have for it, when we say religion now, this is a new concept or a new definition that got attached to the word in modern times. Okay, but if we look back at the source word, religio from Latin. The Romans used the Latin word religio broadly uh, to mean duty, conscientiousness, your obligations, all of the things you had to do and you were expected of you by, um, by society, by community, by your family, and, and, and yes, also by the gods. It's all intermixed together. But it wasn't used, for example, to refer to uh, what we might say do doctrines. So as if, let's say, paganism had a bunch of creeds that you had to memorize or something like that. It wasn't used to refer to um, pouring over sacred texts, and it wasn't used to um, talk about you know, needing to believe in the gods or your belief in the gods and so forth. It's more about, again, your whole uh, uh, duty and obligation and so forth, uh, moral consciousness, that kind of thing that, are, that, were, that would have, how the term would have originally been met. And traditional Roman religion, like I say, what we now call paganism, was all-encompassing, and it involved everything from your house, so you would have your own household gods that refer, you know, again, uh, veneration of ancestors and this sort of thing. Uh, your house would have had, um, 
you know, when you had a threshold and a lintel, there's a lintel god as you cross, uh, uh, when you cross a door frame, that's when there's potential harm can always happen. And so you have to be mindful of that. Uh, your job, so whether you were a, a, a farmer or a sailor or a merchant, they would all have, again, patrons, patron gods, and also uh, rituals of how you have to perform every part of your job. And even everything to do with recreation uh, also follows into religion. And so it's even though we are maybe aware of Greek and Roman temples, Greek and Roman religion was certainly not contained and confined with just those temples. It was everywhere. The old religions also uh, were not focused on, for example, belief in Jupiter and the other gods, nor on studying religious uh, texts about the gods' activities or their teachings. Um, a lot of times, maybe as a teenager, you might have read Greek and Roman mythology, and the gods are doing all of these embarrassing things, and you wonder, how could anybody ever believe in this stuff and this kind of a thing? Uh, and that simply was not uh, the focus of the religion, and that's not um, how the the stories that's not how the stories were met. They're not meant. I mean, they did understand them as being about people and, uh, in other words, beings that actually existed and things that they likely did. But that wasn't the point of the story. So it wasn't historicity focused or literal focused in that way. Um, I keep saying paganism. <laughs> so, so pagan, um, the word was not a word that was used in anti you know in ancient times. It began to acquire its meanings after the mid fourth century, after Christianity had taken over and won and become the state religion of the Roman Empire. Um, so, the, either the word there's two different possibilities of what the word pagan, uh, which originally means um, paganus, which is to say. Um, a town out in the hinterland, so or or a person from the countryside, and so initially, so the word could mean it's a disparaging word that could mean a, a hick, you know, somebody who hasn't caught up with um, uh, the way civilization now is being done in the cities where everybody's become a Christian, or it's alternatively because the people were outside the bounds or the paganas of the Christian community. But it's probably the other one, um, but anyway, like I say, pagan isn't a word that pagans chose for themselves. It's just our modern word and our modern alternative, like even when you sometimes say polytheists, which is to say people who believe in multiple gods, they still wouldn't have said that back then because they didn't think of, um, the, polytheism is only a term in opposition to monotheism, you know? And so it's only when monotheists um, define that as what religion is that, that polytheists get defined in opposition, in other words, to monotheism. So, um, Christianity spread largely as an urban phenomenon, like I say. And so um, when Christianity became the uh, religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century, um, temples in the cities were destroyed. They were repurposed as churches. The old religion was increasingly relegated to that rural peasantry, the Pagani in Latin. This is a picture of the Temple of Athena in Syracuse in Sicily. And you can see the columns are still there from the old Greek temple. And then it's interbuilt with walls, and it's now become um, a Christian cathedral. It actually also became a mosque when it was taken over, and then it went back to being a uh, well, went to being a Latin cathedral at that point after that. So, so um, like I say, the classical literature survived, and so much of our exposure in modern times uh, is to. Uh, Greek mythology, even Roman mythology. And so we're probably aware of the systematized pantheons. So we think of Zeus, who is Jupiter, Athena is Minerva, et cetera. And we have, like I say, a lecture on that topic. Um, literature survives, unlike the unlived, I'm sorry, the lived experience of the non-literate masses. And so we tend to focus on the mythology. And also because Christians and Jews and Muslims focus on text, scripture, and on correct teaching, um, that's one of the reasons why I think we continue to think of um, paganism through the, uh, through the mythology and through the text. Uh, nevertheless, lived paganism was much more than the mythology or worrying about the Greek, the pantheon, the gods, and so forth. Um, Syncretism allowed pagans to get along with a shared worldview, but actually the individual practices were highly localized. And so, um, anyway, so Romans would have seen their god Jupiter as being the same as the uh, the Greek god Zeus, but um, he's worshipped as Jupiter on uh, the Capitoline Hill in Rome in a very specific way. 
So Jupiter may have been understood to be Zeus talking to, when talking to the Greeks, but like I say, his worship in Rome was particular. Roman paganism was primarily about ritual observances, not doctrine. It was performed very legalistically as a contract between the divine forces and humans. So the Roman formula to describe this is do ut deis, I give in order that you might give. In other words, so the Romans do something in order to propitiate the gods and get something back from the gods. And so, for example, in an animal sacrifice, but it also would refer to just all of the comprehensive rituals that accompany lived activity. So also, um, back then, uh, Romans had no concept of the separation of church and state, so the state was intimately connected with religious ritual activity. The Republic, its assemblies, officers, they were all sacred. The politicians filled the public priesthoods. And so, for example, uh, Julius Caesar, in addition to being you know, later the dictator and so on, he was elected Pontifex Maximus, which is to say chief priest of the College of Pontiffs prior to when he became consul. Uh, all time and space, the calendar, the sacred boundaries of Rome, everything were governed by pagan religious observance. We can have here um, if Emperor Augustus, he's wearing a toga, and that's what you would have as your, um, as your uh, civic clothes. But then if you put the thing up over your head like this, then suddenly you're a priest. <laughs> and so that's how, that's how intertwined uh, uh, religion and the state totally were and everything else in, in, in Roman paganism. Um, just as an example of how all-encompassing this is, I have a couple quotes that I have from uh, Pliny the Elder, who was a um, uh, Roman noble, do, nobleman, gentleman, scientist, uh, who got himself killed while he was uh, uh, observing the eruption of Vesuvius. Anyway, he writes, before that time, he wrote, uh, when we are at table, it is the universal practice we see to take the ring, uh, from, off, ring from off the finger. So in other words, you don't want to sit down and wear rings at the table. You got to take your ring off. Another person, again, will take some spittle from his mouth and place it with his finger behind his ear to propitiate and modify the disquietude of mind. When we, mind. When we wish to signify applause, we have a proverb even which tells us that we should press the thumbs. To salute summer lightning with the clapping of hands is the universal practice with all nations, he asserts. <laughs> if when eating we happen to make mention of a fire that has happened, we avert the inauspicious omen by pouring water beneath the table. So you're talking about like uh, th throwing salt over your shoulder and so forth. If you accidentally, if you mention that there's a, been a fire somewhere, you have to pour, pour a little water to prevent there from being a fire here too, right? Or, or, or in other words, a bad omen. These usages have been established by persons who entertained a belief that the gods are ever present in our affairs and at all hours, and who have therefore found the means of appeasing them, even uh, by our vices even. So this is the kind of thing where you, you can actually kind of see what um, living paganism was like. Uh, there's a lot of these things that we think of, and they go across your fingers and so forth, the kind of things that are still maintained a little bit, but. Um, were omnipresent in the past. Um, it was also really important uh, for Roman paganism, anyway, uh, to get things legalistically and done exactly right. So in terms of a correct ritual, Pliny said, it is a general belief that without a certain form of prayer, it would be useless to immolate a sacrificial victim. So if you're going to go do a sacrifice and you don't do a precise prayer, that's just useless that you're even doing it. And that with such an informality, the gods uh, would be consulted to little purpose. And then besides, there are different forms of address to the deities, one form for entreating, another form for averting their ire, another for commendation. We see too how our supreme magistrates use certain formula for their prayers that not a single word may be omitted or pronounced out of place. So. Uh, very, everything has to be done in exactly a way, in such and such a way, in, in Roman paganism. We are told, he says, that King Tullus Hostilius, while attempting, in accordance with the books of Numa, to summon Jupiter from heaven by means of a sacrifice similar to that employed by Numa, that Hostilius was struck by lightning in consequence of his omission to follow certain forms with due exactness. So it's a dangerous uh, thing to not do this exactly right as far as the pagans were concerned, pagan religion. 
Okay, so um, as irreligious as gladiator battles, for example, may seem to us today, uh, all Roman games and sports and so forth were uh, conducted as part of religious festivals, as were chariot races, uh, even plays, uh, dramas, including comedy and so forth. These were all uh, done as part of religious festivals and so forth. Um, so just in some, in terms of Roman paganism, um, we've said this before, we had a lecture on, on paganism, but there are um, a huge number of components of it that don't easily fit with what we now think of when we draw a circle around religion. So there's these personal rituals like saying, you know, Gesundheit, so forth. Uh, there's living dutifully to your family. There's reverence for your ancestors, obedience to sacred civic law, expiation for ill omens, offering sacrifices to the gods, consulting auspices or oracles about what's going to happen in the future, praying to the gods, reverence for cult objects like statues, civic rites, having assemblies, parades, and so forth, initiation into uh, cult shrines. So if you are part of, let's say, um, a local... Uh, like a local bar association where you go to drink, you know, that's also like a, it's like your Elks Club, but it's also a, a local shrine to uh, a certain god and so forth. Military confraternity membership, participation in civic festivals, hearing myths in poetry, concern for things like astrology, participation in markets. So when you go to market and so forth, that's also the market is a religious place. Uh, and it can only be done on religious, certain religious days, and it can't be done on non-religious days, and so forth. Uh, watching the games or holding games, <clears throat> watching or throwing and performing plays, studying philosophy, ethics in terms of dealing with others, and also your personal morality and austerity and so forth. So it is a vast, um, you know, like I say, all-encompassing, holistic thing, uh, re Roman religion, of which now, when we talk about what religion is, you'd only draw around to some of those things. We don't right now usually think of, you know, watching sports necessarily as being religious because that's not what we, not how we define it now. So the modern construct of religion. So since ancient religions and non-Western practices from China to indigenous peoples, those all are or were all-encompassing things, we know where did we get the idea that you could draw a circle around a subset of those activities and call it religion while labeling everything else outside of that circle as secular or non-religious and so forth. And, <clears throat> and as is almost always the case, you know, when you have an idea, where does the idea come from? The idea come from uh, the immediate historical context of when the idea arose. And so we'll look at that and where that came from. So, um, just as a you know, brief way of background to get from Roman paganism to that time period when the idea of religion, modern idea of religion emerges. So Christianity, as I mentioned, became Rome's state religion in the fourth century. And when that happened though, um, the religion continued to be fully intertwined with the state. Um, so Constantine, the emperor Constantine is the first uh, Christian emperor. He uh, calls a council of all the bishops. He presides over that council. Uh, the emperors who follow him uh, generations later, Emperor Theodosius who makes it the state religion, the emperors appoint uh, the, often the popes. They appoint the, certainly the patriarch of Constantinople where the new capital is, the new Christian Rome, uh, and the state, especially in the east where the emperors are, uh, you know, f the church is fully subordinated to and, uh, and uh, church bishops become um, Roman imperial officers and so forth. Um, in the West, so when the Western Empire falls and there ceases to be a Western emperor hanging out in Rome with the Bishop of Rome and the Popes, um, the institutions of the church began to diverge a little bit from the institutions of the state because Germanic tribes replaced the Roman military and German uh, nobles and leaders uh, set up kingdoms and became kind of the, the secular leaders or rather, let's say the the state leaders, uh, while meanwhile, um, the Roman nobles and bishops and language and learning and schools and so forth retreated into the monasteries and also uh, the schools and the institutions of the church. And so in some sense in the West, one of the things happens is that there starts to be 
institutions of state and church while still working very, very closely together, nevertheless um, being in, uh, slightly autonomous of each other because of this um, moment in history with the barbarian invasions, uh, which again separates kind of the, the, the Roman institutions that survive, which become the church, as opposed to the military institutions, which are the, uh, the German state. <clears throat> All right, so fast forward <laughs> uh, to the end of the Middle Ages or through the Middle Ages. So in the central Middle Ages, uh, reformers, like for example, the Gregorian reform papacy uh, in the Middle Ages fought with some success to free church institutions, um, whether they be monasteries or the bishoprics or the papacy itself from secular control. So one of the big fights in the Middle Ages was whether or not um, kings and emperors got to pick who was bishop or not, or whether um, the, the local chapters or the local monks or whoever could pick who the bishop was. Uh, the kings didn't like it that to happen because uh, then the bishop would be very independent as opposed to if, the, if you got to pick and reward the person um, who had been like, say, your, your favorite clerk, your favorite um, priest who was the court priest, if you could say, oh, well, now you're going to get to be Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and you can support me. That was obviously something that the uh, kings wanted to have. So like I say, um, there was a <clears throat> an idea that the church had, that the church wanted to be free of secular control, but never really achieved that in the Middle Ages. Um, but nevertheless, it was kind of on the table, and those uh, the idea of a separation of church and state had started to emerge. But it's only with the split of the church, when the church itself splits apart, during the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, that we really start to get um, this new idea of what we now have as this concept of religion, when that started to get to be framed uh, by the Protestants specifically. So, so Protestants, um, as they emerged, and as they were trying to define who they were and what it meant to be a Protestant Christian, and as a distinction from uh, the Christians that they were not, that were not Protestant, that were not Reformed, um, they started to come up with an idea of also then what religion is in general, or define that too. So it's first framed in order to create this Protestant identity and to cut that identity off from the West, the rest of Western Latin Christian identity, which in the Counter Reformation we started saying it is now going to be called Catholic. I mean, it had always been, everybody had always been Catholic and Latin and so forth before that. Now, Catholic means specifically the non-Protestants. And uh, thus was also in, when they, in coming up with the idea of religion though, in order to create their own identity, the idea of religion was of course inclusive of all of the things that Protestants considered important to religion. So above all, uh, Protestants are focused on text. So sacred text, the Bible, that is obviously the most important thing about a religion. And so, um, and so even, for example, when, when Protestants in England in the imperial age um, came to India and started colonizing India, they went and looked at um, what we now call Hindus. That, that word had never been applied to Hinduism as a religion or anything like that. It's it just people in India. Uh, and they looked at Hinduism and went and privileged texts because these early texts and sacred texts, that must be the basis for Hinduism as uh, the Imperials now named it, uh, because that's how they understood what their religion is. Uh, it doesn't matter if maybe Hinduism wasn't as focused on text as Protestants had been and so forth. Okay, so text. Also correct teaching and above all preaching. So Protestants were very interested in having um, uh, a religion about the head instead of so much about the heart initially, especially, so doctrine, sermons, and so forth. And that included beliefs, and especially belief in and also your personal relationship with God. Those are all part of religion uh, because that's part of Protestantism. But of course, uh, as the Protestants were also framing what religion is, they also used that framework to include the qualities uh, of their rivals, the other, and their other became obviously the Catholics. And so these are all the things that um, Protestants then considered to be kind of bad parts of religion. And just to say, you know, excessive viewing of like rituals as having sacred importance. Um, venerating things like relics. So if a saint has left um, bones or, or uh, some, like somebody's 
some important some St. Mary's scarf or something like that, whatever it is, uh, venerating that relic as a way of being close to the saint and then also maybe praying to a uh, deceased saint who is in heaven for intercession with God or something like that. Those are all part of religion for Protestants, but not part of good religion. These are things that would define you as being Catholic and therefore not good, according to the, again, like I say, this Protestant framework. Um, you know, spending a bunch of time on things like religious festivals, which Protestants saw as just holdovers from paganism, and also focuses on um, monasticism, asceticism, so um, uh, cler clergy that is a priesthood that is very removed by doing things like um, you know, celibacy and so on. In other words, removing yourself from, uh, from the regular lay people and so forth. So that's also religion, but not good religion, according to the Protestants. So this original framing then um, that comes out of this idea that religion and dotted dotted line <laughs> and a model that's dividing it off from not religion, it didn't begin really merely to divide religion from non-religion. It was created kind of as a Protestant lens to divide good religion from bad religion and then inadvertently divide uh, all religion from non-religion. Um, and so Catholics and then Protestants were also aware of Jews and Muslims, and so obviously those are the other as well, and they are also not right from the Protestant perspective. And so they can all be lumped together uh, with the people who don't get it, right? So, um, like I say, this framework of having good religion, bad religion, and then everything that's left out, that incidentally and pretty much accidentally cleaved many traditional cultural activities uh, away from religion in the West. So, you know, because there had been this uh, very obvious institution of the church, which is reformed now and split into two pieces, Protestant and Catholic, um, things like your job, things like the government, things like entertainment, playing, going to plays, sports, you know, the storytellers, even things like um, calendar and holidays, uh, because again, like the Protestants are anti-festival and they, they don't even let you celebrate Christmas initially and this kind of thing. <laughs> um, holidays and things like that also, you know, enter into this kind of not religion area and become secular and so forth. So um, what kind of is the next logical step that grows out of Protestantism and grows actually directly out of Protestant thought is if, if you think that um, you know, rituals and, and so on, and, and festivals and, and, and uh, sacraments and things like that are all, all need to be deleted because they're all too close to pagan. You can just keep deleting until you delete your way out of the whole list of so sermons, God, and so forth. Uh, and then you get to a logical conclusion that in fact, it's actually, there's not good and bad religions, but in fact, everything inside that circle is, is bad religion because all religion is bad religion. And then what ends up being good is not religion. And so that's certainly um, a conclusion that many have taken and has been a next logical step that has come um, out of that original Protestant thought. And indeed, um, just in a social historical sense, um, I would say modern atheism has really grown out of a kind of Protestantism and the Protestant ideas. Uh, although obviously uh, atheism is now in a place where um, Anyway, atheists certainly don't consider themselves to have a religion. They they define their their religion as being not religion. If, in other words, so it's not a religion as far as uh, the self definition. So, there's some potential dangers uh, for that truism. So, although many Westerners uh, today, I think the idea that religion is inherently bad, I think that that's um, true. Well, there's a lot of people who take that as an unexamined truism. But I think that what they don't realize is how much that that is based on what to say is a undefined and rather arbitrary concept of what religion is in the first place. So not knowing um, necessarily what religion is in that broad sense, this undefinable thing, this thing that uh, uh, there's no scholarly consensus of what it even means, um, it, there could be a couple, some traps that can fall in. So for example, nominally secular people in the West can sometimes easily fall into what we might think of as even religious-like beliefs or religious-like behaviors, and maybe some that are even especially naive and potentially harmful. So, um, I don't know, there's all kinds of memes like this, you know, <clears throat> about, um, you know, trust the signs. I, you know, here, that's 
quoted from the universe. So the universe is telling you something. So it was potentially nominally non-religious, but in a way, is it non-religious? I don't know. <laughs> so there's a funny um, skit uh, that Bill Nye, the science guy, has on um, uh, Amy Schumer's show, uh, uh, where um, there are, are some young women that are in a coffee shop, and one of them is essentially telling the other, um, you know, I, I was texting while driving, and so I took a wrong turn, and I went right past this vitamin shop, and I, can, I feel like the universe is telling me that I should be, you know, taking a vitamin D supplement. <laughs> uh, and, so, and so, you know, again, so Bill Nye's kind of sarcastic, um, you know, quote here that the universe here is essentially a force sending cosmic guidance to white women in their 20s. Uh, and he then goes on to say how he thinks, you know, obviously that this is preposterous, this kind of, um, this way. You know, one of the one of the things that it could be just is effective advertising. So, you know, you're going past um, vitamin shop ads all the time. We're exposed to those multiple times. The way advertising works, if you see a message, you have to see it a dozen times for you to internalize it. And you only become aware of it after a certain number of times that you've seen it. That's why you get ads again and again and again. And that's how it works, right? So... Another popular nominally secular idea uh, in, that's running around these days is something like manifesting. And so, for example, we had somebody when we had, uh, um, we were doing in-person lectures and in-person meditation here at Center Place. Uh, we had a guy who was here from, he'd come here for, I think, from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, Alberta. So he was here from Alberta, and, um, and he was here for, like, was going to be for, like, seven weeks and because he had manifested uh that he was going to um he was going to make seven million dollars in seven weeks or something like that and so and so he had no no plan there was no money after after uh seven weeks but he'd manifested it and so he was here in toronto because he was going to have that seven million dollars you know and so um anyway so people think that that you can have something happen simply by thinking it like there's there's of course um all kinds of real power to ideas. There's power in positive thinking. Um, <clears throat> you can train something in yourself to be your second nature by by developing good habits and so forth. There's all kinds of different ways to, um, you know, do things that are uh, mind over matter style things or or use you know effective philosophical tools or these kind of things. But manifesting and having a belief in um, like this kind of thing that's going to supernaturally happen, you get a million dollars or whatever it is. Um, is I would say not not responsible <laughs> spiritual practice. Uh, it's a way that um, nominally non-religious people can actually be kind of superstitious now. So, um, so another sense I would also point out. So, what is religion? Another sense is that in some sense that things like the Super Bowl, which is about to happen, are uh, could be considered religion in a way. So, historically, sports were religious, as I say, the games were. Um, like the Olympics and so on, were religious festivals. Um, and modern sports are still followed religiously. There's probably um, more people are definitely aware that this game is going to happen <laughs> than, than, you know, lots of other things that, uh, that are you know, going on. And they also can include, like, a lot of superstitions. And so there's a lot of people uh, right now who... Um, I don't know, aren't shaving or are wearing certain jerseys or not wearing certain jerseys or they're doing different things because this game is coming or they'll be doing it when the game arrives. And then people also continue to do things like, uh, even though, again, this is nominally secular, they do things like um, practice uh, sympathetic magic. So, for example, if there's a, uh, a field goal, then everybody in the audience will go, like this, like to make it kind of like you want it, you almost by you moving like this is going to make it go into uh, through the whatever, the goals. <laughs> and so anyway, that's sympathetic magic because your motion affects the other motion you think so or whatever. You're doing it anyway, whether you believe in it or not. <clears throat> okay. So my diagram here is that uh, there's not necessarily, uh, not because a good religion, bad religion, but what I would say is that in this area of nominal non-religion then. Uh, these little blocks of superstition and things like that are very much alive and well, whether you're nominally not religious or secular or not. There's lots of those in fundamentalist religion and even in what I consider to be rational religions, lots of people still have unexamined superstitions uh, that you know are ongoing and, and alive and well and so forth. That is not a, um, those are not 
what the religion is. That's not what religion is. Those are incidental to the religions or not religion. Um, one of the things that's another potential danger, I think, in um, deconstructing our own Western traditional practices and religions, um, we still have these longings to have meaning. People still obviously love the idea of physical magic. And so as a result of that, not having our own traditions or having gotten rid of our own traditions, um, there's a rise in popularity of various Eastern traditional practices, Eastern religions, and so forth. And, um, you know, we're more aware um, these days, I think, of appropriation, uh, you know, or when people take things, something out of context that is meant from somebody else and are using it, uh, you know, without enough knowledge and, and to be responsible with it on the one hand. Um, but on the other hand, it's also just, it, even if you do uh, want to use it responsibly uh, with an alien tradition, you have to do a lot of study in order to really understand um, the context of something going on, you know, outside of, you know, you have to really be grounded in it and so forth. So there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but you, um, uh, uh, you have, I think to do it responsibly, you have to um, put a lot into doing something like that. You can do the same kind of cherry picking with our traditions and go back into Western tradition and find, uh, find different practices that you could also exercise responsibly here. So one last thing, uh, danger of the truism that all religion is bad, let's say, um, for me anyway, is maybe the belief that an important conclusion has been reached as a result of deciding that and that the thinking is done. Um, it's the same as thinking that you're done worrying about, I don't know, life and meaning if you just decide, well, I don't believe in God, and so that's the last I had to think about it. Well, actually, that's not the, I mean, you, there's all kinds of other things to think about, and a lot of other people do. I mean, certainly lots of atheists are very thoughtful and are, are, are philosophers and are really busily thinking about uh, how to live the good life and so on. But in some cases, um, when people are coming out of, for example, a fundamentalist religion, uh, they just get to that point where they reject religion, whatever that means, reject their idea of what God is, and then the, and then the thinking is sometimes done. So what I kind of am asking is, where is the forum uh, outside of religion where we in the West can question, for example, all of the obligations that we sort of are forced to buy into as the default of our nominally post-religious society. So we, you know, go to school, we go to, we go to colleges, we learn all these things, we integrate into the economy, we become uh, great, great worker bees for Amazon and so forth. <laughs> you know, where, where do we, um, where do we question all of these, you know, where's the forum you know, we, we have our work lives, we have our family life. Where's the, quest, where's the forum where we're able to, um, you know, challenge all of these kinds of social conventions that we're inheriting and so forth? Where are we examining those? So, so I'm going to argue anyway, and as I'm talking about religion, so we've talked about what is religion and finding that to be, you know, sort of indefinable. Um, nevertheless, uh, if we talk about organized religion in the West, there is a meaning for that because our idea of religion in some ways has come out of a very specific cultural tradition uh, of organized religions um, that continue to have a real, uh, if declining, role in existence in the West. So like all human ideas, in my view, and like all human institutions, organized religions don't have to be you know, aren't necessarily inherently evil or inherently good, but they could be vehicles for good or ill. I'm mean, using as an example here, historically, uh, black churches in the United States have just been an amazing source for uh, leaders in the civil rights movement and for building um, black-owned institutions up from the ground because this is a place where uh, historically um, the community has had control over their own institutions. So obviously there's lots of organized religion that is clearly bad. <laughs> so um, this guy is a televangelist who, he's got a bunch of jets and he has to have a bigger jet. He's telling all of his <laughs> British followers and so they need to send money and as we need a $45 million jet. These jets are too tiny. So, so organizations I'd say that exist solely for the enrichment uh, of leaders, those are harmful obviously to the people who are out their own money and who are giving away the, what little money they have in order to support these kind of lifestyles and so forth. 
Likewise, organizations, I think, that promote kind of like anti-science understandings, uh, if you're doing that all the time, you're young earth creationists and, and so forth, and you're telling people, anyway, that, I don't know, you can also be telling people that blood transfusions are, are harmful or any number of these things that can be a, become a religious doctrine, that can, um, that could be very dangerous for the person's health. It could also leave them very ill-equipped for um, when they encounter a reality-based problem because their worldview is not describing reality as well as a one that is understand within the scientific context. And finally, organizations that use God's name um, to really discriminate against groups, so to put down women or to other, other minorities, LGBT, and even racial minorities and so forth, those obviously cause direct and indirect harm too. Doesn't have to be bad though, <laughs> so I'm gonna argue. So organized religions are an established form, forum for charity and community activism. Um, you know, the little group that we have here at Center Place, it's amazing if you look back over the past half century, the kinds of uh, things that a very small group of people have helped launch and take place. We talked about that Encounter World Religion Center program, which is just, you know, doing just amazing good work in terms of uh, educating people, promoting peace by breaking down barriers of ignorance and misunderstanding and bias. We also have founded social housing charity. We already operate uh, three, uh, three uh, towers that, or three buildings that, um, you know, help, you know, with the, the basic homelessness problem as it prevents uh, some people who would be at risk uh, to mental health issues and other, others of, of perhaps being homeless who are able to have, you know, um, uh, housing justice, the dignity of their own housing and so forth. And we are right now about to break ground on a brand new um, just large new tower that is also going to be a model as being an entirely um, uh, a green building with clad in solar cells and so forth that actually it's not only carbon neutral but it actually the concrete is absorbing carbon <laughs> so we're very happy about uh, you know being able to do something with even a small group so we've also shown hopefully with the lecture our lecture series that churches can be a forum for lifelong learning exploring meaningful ideas in an intentional community that is different from your family or workplace network. So that's our case for what, why we're doing what we're doing. And so, as we get now to the end of the formal lecture, um, I want to leave you again with some discussion questions for you to mull over while Leandro sends me um, some of the questions you've already been sending t in comments. I think we'll probably have a bunch, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> to... uh, uh, there's a lot of comments, but I'm not seeing any I mean, there's just a few questions. Okay, lots of comments, just a few questions. So you can add questions. Um, he's gonna start sending those to me in my phone. Uh, I'm gonna begin by taking a glass of water here. And then we're also going to ask these questions. So do you have family traditions that some members of your family take almost religiously? <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sure that my, we do in my family. <laughs> so what are some superstitions that you've observed outside of organized religion? Do you have personal individual habits that you always follow, uh, but for no particular reason other than that that's what you always do? <laughs> and then finally, where do you find meaning in, for, in life outside of organized religion? And who do you share your ideas with? So those are just some of the things that I thought of in talking about this topic, and we'll talk about some of the other comments you have. Okay. Aron Wagner asks, how many of these pagan rituals were incorporated into Christianity? Um, I wonder if some pagan rituals were also incorporated into Islam and Judaism. Yes, absolutely. So um, almost everything, uh, almost everything about history is, uh, you know, continuity and innovation. And so, and almost every time there's something new, you also retain what went before. And so lots and lots of things um, that would have been, you know, Roman pagan uh, traditions and so forth were taken directly into um, 
into Christianity. And so, um, uh, well, you know, we, so for example, the calendar. <laughs> so the calendar was uh, that we have even to this day. I mean, we still have, um, you know, the names of the gods and the days of the week, but we also have the names of the gods and the months. And the ca calendar is almost exactly the same calendar as, as Julius Caesar made. Um, so we've done a lecture before on the calendar, uh, festivals, holidays, you know, so there's so many of the, um, so many of the uh, Christian holidays are, are kind of pasted on top of, um, uh, on top of existing pagan holidays. And so we've done a bunch of lectures where we talked about that, but, you know, the idea is, you know, like Valentine's Day is around the same time as Lupercalia, Christmas is around the same time as Saturnalia, the um, Easter is the same time in the uh, spring equinox of, of, of any number of um, pagan rituals about uh, you know, rebirth. And so again, with the resurrection and so on, this is the rebirth of the year that happens. And uh, we, you know, we, the reason we have Easter eggs and things like that is it's uh, eggs are a, a sign of renewal and rebirth and so on, fertility symbol. So, um, so it's plentiful <laughs> how these things were, how were incorporated and just be more than that even. Um, so Bob Garrison says, so the separation of church and state is basically uh, an American idea, so it it actually um, it actually gets going um, really seriously in America. Maybe it's one of the first times, and so very early on, the um, uh, the people in Rhode Island, especially, uh, we talked about how, um, for example, the people in Massachusetts when they came across, they did not believe in a separation of church and state, and they did not believe in freedom of religion. They believed in making everybody be a Puritan. <laughs> and, and if you weren't a Puritan, you got kicked out, and you had to go live in Rhode Island. Well, Rhode Island took it pretty seriously the other way uh, about the idea of, of a kind of a, a separation of church and state, which is freedom of religion. Freedom of religion means separation of church and state. A lot of people now in the U.S. don't understand that anymore, and they think that freedom of religion is making their kind of evangelical Christianity, a state religion that is privileged above all other religions. That's not freedom of religion, that's state religion. <laughs> so anyway, it's not, it's, so anyway, freedom of religion is, is toleration. And so as a result of that, um, um, there was even early Jewish settlements in the um, Americas because of, uh, there's a lot of persecution of, of Jews all the way up into obviously the Holocaust and so forth in, and, and beyond. Uh, and, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, the New World became, you know, one of the two centers of Judaism. Um, in terms of it being an American idea, so what ends up happening is after the wars of religion in Europe, um, there is a uh, an understanding that they're not going to be able to make everybody either Protestant or Catholic. The two sides are too um, too equal to um, to conquer one or the other, and so eventually that allows for. Um, the idea of religious pluralism, uh, which is, an, is which is to say, you're allowed to be a different religion than what you, the country you live in. <laughs> so, so it takes a long time, but um, uh, but it it eventually evolves. So it's not only in the U.S., but that's where kind of the idea comes from. So, um, Daryl Scott, I find it um, kind of horrifying how many people are okay with the destruction of the self. Most religions and philosophies see this as a good thing, though they differ in exactly how it happens. So, yeah, it depends on how we're looking at that. So, um, so if it's, um, so in a lot of cases, um, it depends on what you mean by destruction of the self or, or um, maybe what you mean to say here is, um, if it depends on how you're, you're, so if you have a very strong sense of what individual self should be, um, then you're especially, for example, not going to, uh, you know, want to be Muslim, which the whole idea means um, person who is who is subje subject to God, right? Somebody who is acknowledging a higher power that has is really the force behind everything, um, and so um, and so in that sense, um, you know, religion in a, in a sense of like our church, community of Christ, is the idea of of community is, is uh, that. That in other words, our you know as self um, as a group of selves, we we exist and our self is actually created in community. We are are, are uh, community based beings and um, uh, social animals, political animals, as Aristotle would say, and that we only really our self is only really informed and actually created in 
in concert and in community with others, and we feel that we have obligation to those communities and to try to make those communities um, better than rather than lesser. Um, and but if that's if that idea that you have to be part of a community is a destruction of self, that's not as self-focused maybe, uh, an, an idea of self and community as, as others. Um, center place in the book Strange Rites about the rise of the nuns, uh, this is Daryl still, again saying, uh, the author says that movements like social justice, wellness and culture and uh, the alt-right are emerging thought religions. Um, so yeah, so there is, so depends on again what we think of religion as being. And so certainly, uh, so certainly if we think of like say a religion as being let's say an organized religion and an, organi an organizing idea set and so forth uh, that um, attracts uh, like followers, proponents and things like that, um, there can be a pretty good case made for um, in the last century uh, and, and, and before that too, of Marxism as kind of emerging as a, as a religion and, and indeed um, the way, even though it's very um, nominally or very um, aggressively says it's not a religion, but, but, that, but that there were so many things about, let's say, Soviet communism that had all of the earmarks of what you might call a religion, including um, uh, heretics and, and uh, persecution and all these other kinds of things, um, right, right orthodox behavior and so forth, right orthodox thought. So in some ways that could be you know, a negative religion, uh, even though it's very aggressively not a religion. Um, same thing, um, you know, like this alt-right thing you're talking about. So this um, QAnon business, you know, there's our, these are people where there's this you know, kind of obscure anonymous prophet who is sending out all these puzzles and, and predictions. All the predictions are false, everything's gone you know, false, but that just causes, um, you know, it causes some people to leave the maybe emerging religion, uh, but other people, you know, it's the same as what happens when, when any prophecy or prediction uh, in, a, in a more normal or regular religion happens. Um, people explain away the, the failed prophecy, they reinterpret it, they, uh, they double down and now are even more committed to the, the prophet, even though the prophet you know, clearly has a bad track record here. Um, so yeah, I would say in some ways, um, you know, some of these are all, organized, are all functioning uh, in religious ways, but again, it's, it depends on how, which definition or what you're actually coming to when we're thinking about what a religion is. But yeah, that's interesting. Um, Fastball Flake says, regarding my comments about activism and community, it reminds me of the previous lecture about pious frauds. The activism doesn't make the doctrine true, so at what point does one draw the line between? So, um, or is this next? Yeah, the line between a goal to build community and a limited suffering versus knowledge that some of the doctrine is a sat tad suspect. Well, so um, so we don't ha we're not a doctrine based uh, religion, and so in terms of uh, and I and I think we're not operating one pious fraud either because in fact we're, so we're not creedal, and so we are. Um, continuously exploring all of these ideas, just like we do on this. So hopefully, um, as we find uh, problems, and uh, you know, there are, in fact, if we have conception of things. This church very famously um, used to believe that uh, its founder, Joseph Smith, um, as a you know, did not originate. He was not the source or the originator of Mormon polygamy, that it was his followers like Brigham Young that had actually started it and he, and he was opposed. That turns out to be very false. So that, that was a, a view that people believed um, because they didn't know any better in terms of the historical evidence. Uh, but now the evidence is very clear. We have that. And so um, I can say as a historian of the church and as a pastor of the church, we were wrong when we said that before, and in fact, he is the guy who founded that. So hopefully we're doing that whenever we challenge and come up with, um, with that same kind of information. Um, and, so, and so therefore, um, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be a pious fraud in order to do those good community things, is what I would say. So Monica Taylor says, in a conversation I recently had with a coworker, I made a comment that God exists outside of space and time and that I don't believe in the supernatural. And she said a belief in something that exists outside of space and time is a belief about something supernatural. So 
So we're confused um, here about what we mean by supernatural. So uh, you're both right. <laughs> so, so see, one of the things, the, one of the ways that people define um, supernatural is um, is a is a physical um, magic thing that is happening in time and space, and that and that it's happening in an unexplained way, and that the cause is therefore a supernatural cause that's happening within the natural world. Whereas, um, so whereas if you're saying, like you're saying, that God exists outside of time and space, your conception here of God as being, um, is being not material, right? In other words, God is, um, God is in this realm of the spirit, the idea, and so forth. That's different from um, uh, saying that, a super, you know, that there's some kind of a, a supernatural intervention that is happening, uh, you know, like like Zeus hitting you with a lightning bolt or something like that. So there's a, those are two different two different things. So so, um, but we're we're very unclear about it because we um, we tend to be very clear unclear about it because people are very focused on um, on the material world, and so we um, we're even now aware that. Um, that matter and physical energy are the same thing. So, uh, you know, e equals mc squared, right? And so matter and energy can be converted and back and forth. And yet a lot of times people like to use the words, especially spiritual people like to use the words about energy. And so what they mean is non-material energy, non-physical energy, and spiritual energy, in other words, as opposed to um, electricity or something like that, which would be a material energy. So it's, I think that's why it's confusing. So uh, Roan has actually given us a couple answers to the question on the screen. And so that first question, what are some of the things that uh, some of your family members take religiously? So holiday dinners, family birthdays, and that's, of course, we do that too. Certainly um, the way uh, my family opens Christmas presents is pretty amazing. <laughs> and so there's multiple trees, there's all the family stockings, there's Santa presents, there's the the gift exchange, I mean, it's just a matter of moving from house to house and, and which one is done where and so forth. So that exactly like um, you're talking about. Um, he's also saying, what are some of the superstitions you've observed uh, outside? He says he's probably more than aware that he's aware of and same thing with his individual habits. And where does he find meaning outside of organized religion? He finds it everywhere, but he doesn't have uh, many people that he's sharing ideas with. Um, J.R. Orlando tells us, I've worked in theater all my life. I wouldn't ever say good luck in a theater, <laughs> a whistle in a dressing room, or name the Scottish play, mainly because if anything goes wrong, then it's your fault. So yeah, those are wonderful, um, like you say, wonderful theater superstitions that are, are pretty, pretty universal, right? Um, uh, John Booker's full spectrum, is there a reason to believe that communi I'm sorry, that communion might have connections with kin cannibalism, eating your own deceased relatives in ancient Roman religion. Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so, so I think that um, I think that um, that early Romans were very, you know, were did accuse Christians of being cannibals. <laughs> so Christians are are talking about um, consuming the blood blood and body of Christ. Uh, when, and so that's going back to the beginning. And so it does sound, when you start saying you're doing that, it, for anybody who, hasn't, who isn't really aware of how um, you know, entirely, um, well, so entirely symbolic, but, in, you know, but also, let's say, metaphysical in their understanding of it, as opposed to physical, their understanding of it is, um, uh, led to an, a notion that you know, and again, accusations that Christians were cannibals and so on. But I don't think that, I think that this is a um, uh, an independently created, you know, just a, 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 a sacred, sacred meal and also a sharing of um, uh, the purpose of, of Christ as the community. So the community is understanding itself to become the body of Christ as they're um, consuming and, and symbolically partaking of the body of Christ. And so the idea here is, um, is more related to, I think, uh, 
Greco-Roman um, philosophical ideas of, of substance. And so we call it um, like trans substantiation is the way the, the, Christ, the Catholic doctrine works. It doesn't mean transmaterialization. It's not matter. The matter is not being transformed like a transporter beam or something like that that is actually making it that way. The substance is being um, transformed and the substance is the purpose. And so uh, in the same way that Christ and the church, the body of Christ, which is to say the church when everybody is actually at their best in, and God are all you know, of one purpose, that means they all share the same, the same substance, because um, purpose and substance are the same. Um, Gracious Greek, is science becoming a religion? Uh, what are the dangers of science being treated as such? Uh, hopefully not, <laughs> um, I would say. Um, so science, um, so science has, there are a bunch of qualities to science. <laughs> Well, no, there's a bunch of qualities to science that work like any other human thing. And so one of those is, is that we, um, we use, tell, use stories and we tell stories and narrative how to make things so. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like the way science is told and the way science is understood, uh, where, where what I call like the history of science narrative, um, which actually comes out of, um, in some cases, again, this, Protestant anti-Catholic narrative. And so we're gonna have a lecture in a couple months on um, revisiting the Galileo story uh, about, um, because this happens so much. So I've had, uh, um, you know, when I made this charge, I made what maybe wasn't as, it wasn't as um, alarming a charge to some of you, but maybe for some of you it was. When I said here in the, tonight, I said, not all religion has to be bad. <laughs> you know, for some people that's, that's, uh, they definitely want to contest that. Um, and so I, I've talked about that before to, um, to friends of mine who were in a, you know, kind of having a public interview and discussion and, and their response was, well, what about Galileo? Why, you know, uh, the church burned Galileo at the stake for teaching science. And, <laughs> And I'm like, no, no they didn't actually. <laughs> that didn't, they, Galileo didn't get burned at the stake or anything like that. But anyway, but it, the story gets ba made better because we we tell stories in order to un, you know in order to um, uh, explain a kind of a narrative of how things work. But science, um, um, so science in an individual um, human time period frame, um, an individual scientist might get very enamored with a theory and hold on to it longer. Than, than maybe they should, but there are new scientists that are kind of constantly be coming up and eventually challenging uh, a theory that isn't going to be well grounded. And so we've seen, for example, in uh, especially uh, in my lifetime, the realm of of cosmology. Um, you know, there's been just crazy advances in our understanding of how you know how big the universe is, how much is in the universe. Um, the idea that you know there was it was still theoretical whether the universe was um, was steady state where it was expanding and it was gonna come back and was doing that back and forth. And now it's pretty clear that it's only expanding and it's just gonna keep expanding and so forth. And so in other words, there's lots of new, um, uh, new you know, there's a brand new telescope that's been launched. So there's lots of new, um, new data, new findings, new theories, and that's continuously um, overturning what would have been, let's say, old theories and dogmas. And so uh, it doesn't seem to be in a lot of danger um, in be turning into a religion right now. Uh, Bob Garrison asks, how did the religion of Joseph Smith become the religion of Warren Jeffs? Can we use the same term for both these two expressions? So, um, so you know, a lot of things that Joseph Smith did, uh, you know, that there's some seeds planted and some precedents that, um, that have ended up having bad results and bad fruit. So in some cases, there's a very wide spectrum of of the different Latter-day Saint tradition churches that have emerged from um, that original foundation of the church from 1830 to 1844. Um, and so um, one of those expressions is um, the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the FLDS church that Warren Jeffs was the leader of, um, you know, down at the, in Hilldale, Colorado City. Um, and, and Warren Jeffs, you know, was able to use um, a lot of precedents to show that, uh, a, to assert a doctrine of, 
of one man rule and one, one man being God's own representative on the face of the earth and everything that he's saying is effectively speaking for God. And, and it turned out that that particular guy was, did not have a very um, balanced grounding in reality once he had total power and did sociopathic things uh, and horrible abuses and things like that. Um, and so, uh, so unfortunately, one of the things that can happen with, like I say, you, when you do things for good or ill, one of the things that can happen, especially in um, little, uh, high, high maintenance, you know, small group, uh, very high, um, high maintenance, where you have to really do everything within the church, a church that a group that's more let's say cult-like in the sense that you, you, can't have exp uh, you can't have communication with the people outside, that the church owns all your property, that everything you know, is controlling who gets to marry who and so forth. Um, these are, these are um, uh, unfortunately, uh, ki the kind of religion that can very quickly uh, lead to very serious abuse and often does, unfortunately. Uh, and so I would say, and there are some precedents though, it's not that, um, uh, Joseph Smith and Warren Jeffs are uh, cut from the same cloth, but you can see why um, Warren Jeffs is able to build on some of the bad precedents that Joseph Smith set in the 1840s. Is there any more? Uh, no, I'm not finding oh. All right. Well, that's quite all right. Well, thank you so very much. This was a wonderful uh, discussion. Hopefully you found it interesting. Um, I wanna remind everybody that Thursday, we're having a companion lecture, what is spirituality? Um, I think that goes right along with the same question. And we'll also see where some of our Western modern ideas about spirituality came from. <laughs> Everyone wants, wants a lecture on metaphysics. And we wanna do, and there's a question, and a request for lectures on metaphysics. So we will put that in the queue for everybody. <laughs> yeah, we wanna talk about metaphysics and meaning. So that's a great thing to do in the future. All right, thanks everybody.